We're live, 709. A couple of minutes. <laughs> That's kind of just got finished with another live feed before this, which was very fun. We were talking about uh, RV motors versus L28s. And um, right, so right off the bat, if you guys have not, please take a look at the video that I put up on nitrous camshafts and whether or not nitrous camshafts work, <laughs> whether or not every camshaft is a nitrous camshaft. And I'm sure just like with the boost stuff, I got all kinds of comments already about from people telling me, oh, no, you get, you know, you got to have a nitrous cam shaft. It really works. It, it does this. And it does this. And I'm, I'm like, you're completely missing the point. Very, very tiny amount of people need a dedicated nitrous cam. You have multiple kits and that kind of stuff. Pro mod, big motor, all that stuff. Uh, you know, handfuls of people need that. Thousands and thousands of people over here have junkyard motors and street strip motors and whatever. Like with a turbo, you need to concentrate on what is my NA power. And with nitrous, it's really for two reasons. One is that you need to concentrate on your NA power. And then just like boost, when we add nitrous, we're adding power on top of whatever that starting point is. So the thing in the video was that, hey, if we start off with a 300 horsepower motor and we add 100 shot, we get 400. But if we start off with a 400 horsepower motor and we add 100 shot, we get 500. And, and the 100 shot stays fairly consistent in my testing. I, when we add enough nitrous to add 100 horsepower, it adds 100 horsepower or 150 or 200. When you start getting at big shots, then we can discuss things. But, but even then, <laughs> we've run 300 shots on stuff on junkyard motors. And the difficulty is not with the cam timing. The difficulty is getting the thing to be consistent, having the right bottle pressure and the right bottle fullness and the getting the tune to be exact. And as long as you're supplying a given amount of nitrous for 95% of us, that's what dictates the power output. That was what, that is what dictates the power. Day. You can get to a point just like with boost that we talked about where you're, you can start then modifying the cam timing to do very, very particular things. But here's the other benefit of worrying about NA power on nitrous. There is some of this on boost, but to a way lesser extent. This is the reason that when we do a big bang on motors, like when I did a big bang with the nitrous, we're trying to get to 1,000 horsepower with a 500 horsepower NA motor and starting off with that. Whereas with boost, we can get to 1,500. <laughs> and in this case, we could go way beyond that if we had the strength of the internals to go along with that. Whereas with the nitrous, if we're starting off with a 500 horsepower motor, it's we, we will never get to 1500, no matter how much nitrous we put on. It's just never going to get there. The motor cannot process that much. So with nitrous, it's also a big benefit when you're trying to add more nitrous and get more power gains from the nitrous to have more NA power. Because the more NA power you have, obviously we already talked about the higher you're ultimately gonna get to with it, whatever nitrous you add, but also it allows the motor to then process more. So if you're stepping up to the big jets, having lots of motor to process all that nitrous through, it just works out better. So what I always recommend is people always wanna know, well, yeah, what nitrous cam should I use? I'm like, look, and, and this is something that a lot of guys that are doing camshafts don't tell you. Oh, you need to pick this nitrous cam because it makes power. Yeah, it makes power with the nitrous and you've only run it with the nitrous. You didn't run it NA and compare it to the other cam that this guy might be replacing or a stock one. And this new cam that you just double throw down special nitrous cam you put in made more NA power. So when it does that and you add our 100 horsepower or 200 horsepower with the nitrous, what is it going to do? It's going to make more power not because the camshaft was special and dedicated to the nitrous, but because the cam itself made more NA power. So I get that a lot. I'm not saying that there's not something there <laughs> way over here. What I'm saying is for the vast majority of us, here's where you need to look. And that's NA power plus nitrous. So, and then that got me thinking about along the lines of tuning. And so I wanted to do a little thing tonight on tuning, basically just covering the basics for tuning things that people should be thinking about, just like with this nitrous deal. I'm not going to tell you what specific cam valve events that you need for your nitrous motor because it would be individualized. But I can tell you, worry about any power and then add nitrous. Same thing with tuning. I am, so for the record, right off the bat, I am not a tuner. So I am not somebody that could tune your car or would tune your car. I'm not that guy. 
having said that, I've tuned lots of stuff on the engine dyno, particularly at wide open throttle. If I wanted to go in and do, you know, idle speed and I guess cruise and stuff, but that that's not something that we do on the engine dyno. It's not something that I do because I'm more interested in getting the dyno results. And so I tune the areas that I need to tune, make that work, make it repeatable and then go on to doing the changes that I need to do. I've, oh, I've had a new cylinder head. Okay, well, it's now leaner. I need it added once it's flowing more air. It now needs more fuel. I need to change that and get the air fuel right and all that. And all that's fairly easily done. But what a lot of guys don't get, and people that would be watching this video for the very beginner guys, you need to understand a lot of things before somebody teaches you the actually the actual logistics of using and manipulating the thing that you're tuning with, HP tuners, SCT, Holly, Fast, whatever it is. The first thing that you need to understand is you need to understand the motor that you're working with. So you need to understand its needs. So from a very basic standpoint, here are some of the very beginning things that help you understand what the values then you put in to your laptop or whatever to get the motor to run right. Because it's very important. Lots and lots of guys, and this is especially the case on turbo and supercharged cars because we all are addicted to boost. And as soon as we put on our turbo kit and put on our big injectors and our pump and we go out and we run it, and we're like, yeah, I want to feel the boost. And you go out and fill the boost. And you're like, man, this thing is ripping. And then it all blows apart because it was too lean or more than likely it had too much timing. So it runs really good under boost when it has too much timing and right until it doesn't. And here's the first basic thing. If you're going to miss on one thing or the other, have way too little timing in the motor because if you have not enough fuel it takes longer for you to break something with not enough fuel for instance if you're running a boosted motor you should be running somewhere in the 11s let's say from 12 down to 11 if it gets fatter than that it can get problematic or make a little bit less power it's still safe and it still runs if it gets leaner than that you start getting into a problem so you have a big safety area window for air fuel if it gets too lean, if you're running 13.0, which everybody says, oh, this is where you need to run NA motors. I haven't found that to be the case in the testing that I've shown. I have lots of tuning videos up where not where I wasn't demonstrating to you how to tune. I was showing you what happens when we run on an NA motor 13 to 1 and 12 to 1 and 11 to 1 and 10 to 1 and showing you what happens in power. So on an NA motor on the air fuel, you can miss by a lot. It could be 13 to 1. It could be 12. It could be 11. It could be 10 to 1. And you're only going to be down a little bit of power. So you've got a big window there. On a turbo application or a blower application, your window becomes smaller. So you don't want it to be at 13 to 1. You want it to be richer. You want it to be 11 and a half to 1, let's say. It'll run at 11.8. It'll run at 12.0. But it won't run very long at 13.0. But it will run longer at 13.0 under boost than it will with 4 degrees too much timing. <laughs> so... The way that we look at timing, and air fuel is an easy thing. You need to make it 11, 11 and a half to one. If you're just starting out and you search and you get that number or, or richer, yeah, that's great. You'll be winning. That will work just fine. On timing, it's a, whole, it's a whole nother thing. The way that I look at timing for tuning these, these applications is that if, you, if you've got a boosted application, the easiest way to know how much timing you can get away with or have a good idea of how much timing you can get away with is to know how much timing your NA combination wants. So for us, when we're running on the engine dyno, it's kind of an idealized environment. When we run a naturally aspirated LS, it wants about 29 or 30 degrees of total timing. Under boost, it's obviously going to want less than that. And how much less than that we have is going to vary based on two things. It's going to vary based on a few other things too, but the two major things are engine speed and boost. <laughs> so we need to talk a little bit about that. And let's talk about it starting with an NA motor. So for you guys that are just starting out and are watching this video, your motor will want some kind of timing. And what you're trying to do is get the spark to happen and for the expansion to happen and push down on the piston at the right time. Because we change the engine speed, when you have to ignite that for that, that expansion to happen at the right time varies. 
as we go faster, we have to ignite it a little bit earlier for it to happen at the same spot over on the other side. So we're igniting it as the piston's coming up and, and it's expanding actually because the piston's already gone around and it's, and it's expanding as the piston is going down. So you, that's, you want that to happen. So you want to time that. And we know when the timing is right on that, when we're making the most power. The dyno tells us that. Oh, look, it likes this amount of timing. This amount of timing is going to vary based on engine speed. So at the horsepower peak at 6,000 RPM or 6,500 RPM, it's going to want a lot of timing. It's going to want the most amount of timing. And then from there out, it seems to be fairly consistent. Actually, even before the horsepower peak, somewhere between the torque peak and the horsepower peak, it's going to want that much timing. In an idealized, like in our environment on the engine dyno, even running 91, we can run all of the timing on an NA mode, even on one that has 10 or 11 to 1 compression. We can run all the timing in there, and it won't detonate because we're running the motor cold also. So we have cold air, we have cold water, and we have enough air fuel. We have, with even with 91 octane on these NA motors, it doesn't detonate. So we have the ability to run, we have some safety margin there. So we can run that and find out, hey, does it like this? So for instance, we can, if we run the motor from 3000 RPM to 6,500 RPM, I can put 29 degrees everywhere and, and run it. The thing is that even though it will do that and it will make some kind of power curve, it doesn't need that much timing down low. It wants less timing. And so what we do when I'm doing, when, when we're doing the timing curve on an NA motor is we'll start out low. So something, if we know, because it's an LS and I've run hundreds and hundreds of these things, we know that it's going to end up somewhere near 29 degrees, at least at the power peak. We know that it's going to want less than that when we load in and it's going to normally want less than that at the torque peak. And we also put less timing at the torque peak anyway, because that's where detonation is going to occur. So the torque peak and below is where you're going to get detonation. That's where it's going to be most prevalent. So that's the critical area. And that's where you want less timing. So what we do is we start out low. Let's say that, let's say we've got our 29 degrees at the top. We may start out at 20. So we'll put 20 in everywhere and then go, okay, we run it and go, okay, it's making this power curve. And then we'll put 21 in. Oh, it made more power like that. And, then, and what's going to happen is you're going to get bigger gains at the higher RPM ranges and less gains down low because it really has near optimum timing already down low. You'll see less of a difference down there. And so what will happen is as we keep adding timing, we'll create a curve. Because if we went from 20 degrees to 21 degrees at, at 3,000 RPM and we didn't gain any power, it stays at 20. In fact, if it didn't gain any power, we might be tempted to go down. It, it's not going to, in this case, on an LS. But we might be tempted to go down. What you want is the least amount of timing that's going to provide the most power. And again, we're going to talk about why we might take away even more and not get maximum power just to have it be safe because it's going to run hotter in the car and in that environment. So this optimized timing that we have on the engine dyno, it's probably not going to share in the car unless you're running good gas and you've got a good cold air intake on the stuff. So we will keep adding timing. And what will happen is we'll get to a point where we don't see any gains down low. So we keep that timing curve, keep that timing number there. And then we'll keep adding and it'll keep picking up at the top. And what will happen is that at each point, we'll stop at the point where we don't make any more power. And what this system will do is create our curve, or at least our wide open throttle curve. So it will create a curve for us. So it'll go from 20 to 21 to 22 to 23. And at some point, it will just keep wanting 29 degrees. And we can get away with that. Again, we can get away with that, like past the torque peak, and it will make good power. In the car, even past the torque peak a little bit, you may want to strip some out of it, and you probably will. But for our environment, that's what we do. And once we've created a timing curve NA, we now have that timing curve under boost. All we do is take timing away everywhere. Because normally when I run a motor under boost, we're usually running it with good gas. I don't normally tune these things on 91. And if I do tune them on, tiny, on 91, we will take away a ton of timing. <laughs> we want it to be not just safe, but ultra safe. I don't know why I'm so worried about 91. I've seen guys do a lot of stuff with it and make lots of power, but it just, it just worries me. So most of the turbo stuff that I run is with E85. For one, it's, it's safer and it makes more power, 
but also it's readily available to me right down the street when I'm testing at Westlake. So it's easy to use. So we'll take timing away. Normally we run these things like with a Turbo LS, especially any sort of reasonable boost level. It'll be 20 or 21 degrees at the top and then you know, maybe down in the teens, down low when we're loading into it. The other thing that I like to do on a turbo motor, especially if I'm loading at 3000 RPM and it's a, the turbo and the engine combination is sized such that I see boost down there, we'll take more timing away. Because a stationary load, when we're first loading it, the motor never sees that out in the real world. So I want to take timing away so during the stationary load, it doesn't hurt itself. Because that's another area where it can hurt itself. So if we had all the timing in at 3,000 and we had the eight or 10 pounds of boost, that would create a problem. So you want less timing, always go with less timing. Um, so we would take timing away. And so we would now have the same kind of curve. We just take timing away everywhere and that will get us very, very close. Now it might be that you wanna go in and trim some away at the torque peak if you're driving on the street to further take timing away. Some guys wanna take timing away to limit power for drag racing applications because they're trying to get better traction. There are a lot of other things that can go into tuning that. But like I said, for any kind of reasonable boost level, we might be around 20 or 21. With pump gas and more than 10 pounds, more than likely you're going to be in the low to mid teens for, for peak timing, less at the less at the torque peak. The thing is that as you take timing away, below the torque peak, just like it did NA, it has less of an effect on power, but it has a big effect on, on the detonation threshold. So you're getting safety and not really trading a whole bunch of power. So it's much better to be safe there. So when we do this, we'll, and, and I want, I actually want to start doing more 91 octane tuning on the engine dyno. And I will be doing that. So we'll be running some things on 91 and we'll try to get some sort of, you know, idea on what we can do on power. Cause a lot of guys are running that a lot of, a lot of guys are forced to do that because the 85 is not available. Race gas is ridiculously expensive. So they, they want to do that. And so I will be more doing more of that, but the key is, and, and whether you're running E85 or race gas or pump gas, I, I tend to keep the air fuel the same. And I know that guys are like, oh, but you can't do that with E85. No, we're using it on the gas scale. So all we've done is supplied a whole bunch more E85 to achieve the same gas scale number. Um, so the E85 works really well. It adds power by itself and it adds the safety margin. All of our stuff, unless I do a specific intercooled versus non-intercooled deal, I always try to run an intercooler. A lot of times it's an air to water deal that we have a big supply of water going through. So again, another safety margin. The turbo is out in front of everything. So all of the, because I've gotten comments before on the wastegate exhaust. Oh, you're just wastegating the exhaust and it's getting sucked up with the turbo. I'm like, no, none of that is happening. So we're getting a good cold air source into the turbo. All of that's working well. All of the exhaust is getting sucked back. So when you're tuning, and this, like I said, this is very important. Here's the takeaways from the tuning thing. Make sure that, <laughs> you take timing out of it a lot and don't be worried about it would be much better if you were putting a, together a combination that you turbocharge and you went out and it didn't feel as good as you wanted it to feel but you came back and you still had a motor to tune that's a much better scenario than you going out and, oh man this feels great and it's just nothing but smoke and sadness that, that's not a good combination so start there, start with more fuel that you need and less timing that you need. And then both of those are on the safety end of the spectrum and then start, you know, bringing them a little bit closer and then you can see what happens because it's always better <laughs> to start safe on your tune and end with something. Like if you eventually want to blow it up because you're, I don't know, you're in the finals or whatever, and you're going to put 24 degrees in it and you're going to run it at 12 to one because you have to win the race, then that's okay. But you don't do that the first time out. And that's how I go about tuning these things. And these are the things that I'm thinking about is one of, uh, and, and this is fairly, not fairly new, but it wasn't me a long time ago. N number one is like safety of the motor, not safety from it blowing up and hurting somebody, but safety from the motor still being there and being able to keep tuning and keep doing testing. Because if I have motors that are together and ready to run, and I can do a bunch of testing on them, 
my life is a lot easier because coming down and having to build a motor to then test is, is just, it's very, very time consuming. And I don't get nearly as much done if I have to do that. So if I can constantly have a motor that's, or motors that are there and ready to go and still in good shape. So safety is a key element anymore. I don't, cause I can remember back in the day, I was like, Oh no, we were, we're at, we're at 489. We totally can get to 500. And then you're like, Oh, 500, bam. And it blows up. You're like, yeah, I probably didn't need those other two degrees of timing. But you get like that, though, and that, and that happens. It's easy to get like that. But anymore, it's a lot smarter to go, look, 49, that's good. It's still alive. Take it up. Take it off. We got to put another one on. We got another one to test. It's safe. It did the number. I get to do the video or whatever, and, and, uh, and all that's working out. So it's much better to have that. Because the other thing that can happen is if you put something together and you're tuning it, if you're learning for the first time on how to tune, you're going to make lots of mistakes. You're not going to you're not going to check these boxes that you need to have checked. Your maybe your fuel pump is going to be clogged. Maybe the filter is. Maybe it's an old fuel pump. A lot of things can go wrong. That and and that's why when you're one the other thing that you need to learn when you're tuning is put in these <laughs> put in rev limiters and over boost situations. Put all of those safety factors in there. Um, learn those things first. And then learn the other things. Start off with a known map, like the, the the photo that I have up for the thumbnail is a map. And one of the things I want you to notice on this map that if you look at the intersection, I don't know if you guys can zoom in there enough to see it, but if you look at the intersection of a thousand RPM and 10 pounds of boost, it has 18 degrees of timing. And that's going to be our poll for tonight. Okay, so the poll for tonight is 18 degrees of timing at 10 pounds of boost and just a thousand RPM. Too much timing on pump gas. We'll see what people have to say. And I'm going to scroll back here and see what you guys are doing while you guys are all answering the question. <laughs> Tuning is all I know. Every cam is a cam. They are, they are cams. I was trying to learn Holly Tuning better. The, the interesting thing about learning tuning, and I'm I'm obviously, I'm not a tuner, but the, the interesting thing is that there are a lot of other, like these little, I call them subroutines, <laughs> um, but, a, but a different, you know, drop down menus, things that you can look at and use that you never knew before or never utilized before. There's always something new to learn. And that's why talking to people that do this and they can tell you tricks and go, oh, here, you're, this this graph needs to kind of look like this. And this is a good start. This is a good start for TPS and, you know, all these things. Um, and, and having that, like having some sort of base thing so that the motor starts, then doing stuff from there makes it a lot easier rather than you having to figure out some kind of base map that's difficult it's nice of the like with the holly stuff of them to have that one liter mafia is in the house every cam is an expensive cam not the stock ones everybody hit the like button you were using one fuel line for nitrous or an additional fuel pump in line on the engine dyno when we were doing it the nitrous has a dedicated um fuel feed so we adjust the fuel pressure going to the nitrous independently of the carburetor so we can make the fuel line or make the fuel pressure feeding the fuel solenoid anything that we want. I have a question as far as blowers. I have a small box Chevy, 63 Nova. Nice. I want a root style blower, but I'm also eighth race checked. Check Whipple twin screw, which they claim is way more efficient. A, I can't answer your question, unfortunately. Terminator X is a great system. The self-learn is okay at best. I wouldn't rely on it as a final tune. Still need someone to tune it. Yeah, the that's the other thing is that is that I don't ever run stuff in closed loop. The only time I would ever do that is if I wanted to do self-learning for like part throttle and drivability for transition stuff. Maybe we would, we would, 
you know, we would load in what we want the air fuel to be. And then we can drive it around a little bit on the dyno and have it go, oh, it's yeah, here, we, we want it here, we want it here, we want it here. And then it will go and do that. I don't normally do that. What I do is I just manually control the air fuel and timing numbers. And then I just get it to do the thing that I want it to do. Like I will do a stationary load at 3000 RPM. Like, oh, it's 11.2. Okay, we want to take away a little fuel there. And then see how it transitions from the idle, which we would tune the idle part of it, just to make sure that it, when it returns back, that it does idle and doesn't die. And then we would transition from, oh, look, it's getting lean there. It's getting 14.5. So we would add a bunch of fuel there. And not even, if it's 14.5, I just want to make it 12.5. So I add a bunch of fuel until it's in, in some kind of range. Because during the transition, I'm not looking for a particular number. I'm looking for, oh, yeah, it's 12.5, it's 11.5. It didn't get too fat. It didn't get too lean. It transitioned nicely from one to the stationary load, in which at the stationary load, now it's whatever the air fuel on an NA motor, it's 12.5. And then we do a couple of loads at 3,000, 3,500, 4,000, go, yeah, it's close enough. We, I set up the RPM range I, I run it to, and we'll start it out running from 3,000 to 5,000 and make a short sweep and go, oh, look, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It looks like the curve is the way that we think it's going to be. We can run it out farther. And what I'm doing is while I'm making a run, I'm watching the air fuel meter. We know it doesn't have any timing in it to start out with because we purposely didn't put timing in it. We see what the timing, we see what the, uh, we know the timing has less timing. I'm watching the air fuel. If it gets too lean, I'll pull off and we'll adjust it. Oh, it needs eight clicks there. I'll put eight clicks in and we'll get the curve the way that we want it and have it, have the air fuel curve be what I want. But I don't run um, closed loop under wide open throttle hardly ever. Not, not that you can't, but I, I just don't do it. Timing suggestions, maybe max timing, 5'3", 475, ring gap. Springs, snow performance, air to water, chili bomb. How is it? Is it just one chili bomb on there? Just like the small one? Because I, I think that that would be not enough intercooler, I would suspect, for what you're talking about there. The later roots blower will work better. Um, I don't know exactly about that Whipple supercharger, but a twin screw is more efficient than a roots blower. I like when they fit under the hood or pop through with a cow induction hood. Timing range NA for a small block forward. Most of our stuff on small blocks wants to be at 35 or so for most of the small block forward stuff that we run at the top. I watch so much of your content when looking at the NSR cam, I, it gets confusing. Some have more lift than 500, but they advertise it as an NSR cam. Can you shed light on this? I don't know which ones in particular you're looking at, but they may be NSR cams for the later head. So it might be an LS3 NSR cam because the LS3 heads and the LY6 and, and some other heads have 550 lift springs on them from the factory. So they will work, these other higher lift NSR cams will work with those 550 lift springs. They just won't work with the 500 lift 706 springs. Can you please advise a compression ratio for a 347 for mostly track 3,200 pound Falcon on carb, was EFI, alloy heads, want good power for long-term reliability? Um, 10 to one seems to be a pretty good number for that. 2005 Denali with a six liter LQ4. I want to do an NSR cam. Would you suggest a truck Norris? I don't know if I've tested that NSR 218, 226 cam from Comp. And I don't know what springs are on your LQ4. It's a 317 head, right? You need to look and see. I'm not sure what is on that motor. I'm not sure if they're the later 550 springs or if they're the same springs that the earlier LQ4s would have shared with, which would be like the, um, cause they had the smaller cams in them. So I'm not sure. Um, if you have the early springs, then you can't run that 540 lift cam.
without a dyno, would you just keep bumping timing until you see a knock on a particular cell? No, that's the problem with doing it out on the street is the, and, and what makes a good tuner, the tuners for the street and on a chassis dyno, unless you have a factory ECU, which they do that stuff too, I guess, then you'd have knock counts and you know when you've gone too far. Otherwise, they're relying on like a Holly or whatever. They're, they're relying on known timing curves that they've run and ones that will not produce detonation, like I said, which is why they're running them hotter. They're running them with the hood closed and all that. And so they're running them with much more conservative timing numbers than we run on the engine dyno. Uh, grab a plug. It'll tell you what you need to know. It won't tell you what you need to know if you idle the car and drive it around. It will only tell you whatever that wide open throttle is. And is it going to tell you that it was rich at 3,500 and then lean at 5,000? But it can tell you timing. But 351 Windsor, 10 pounds, pump 93, Holly ECU, car. Uh, high eights compression. Uh, Tim, the lower the compression, usually the more timing that they want. And that also goes along with big combustion chambers. And if you, Matt, had, over at Sloppy has done a lot of pump gas tuning and his, his rule of thumb, and I don't know how accurate it is, but it seems like it would be, is uh, 14 degrees of timing and 14 pounds of boost. So I'm sure that that 14 degrees of timing on pump gas, and he may be looking at 93 where he is and not 91 like we have. I'm sure that that 14 degrees is at the horsepower peak and not at the torque peak. It's probably less than that. How's our, is 18 degrees of timing at 10 PSI and 100 and 1,000 RPM too much timing on pump gas? <laughs> How is anybody saying no to that? The secret to running good power on pump is good quench and swirl, dynamic compression ratio less than 9.5 to 1, good inlet air temperatures. What program would you suggest for tuning a stock GM computer? I don't know anything about tuning stock computers because I don't ever do that. I don't do any chassis dyno tuning or street tuning or any of that. I only do Holly stuff and the MS3 Pro Mega Squirt deal on the engine dyno. Can it be done? Can it be done driving? Yeah, you can you can tune something driving, but you have to know you, you can't maximize the timing driving unless maybe you're listening for audible detonation, but that would be scary to me. But you can if you have an idea of where the timing should be, and there's lots of information out there where you could probably get a fairly good idea of what the wide open throttle timing curve should be like. The airfield can easily be done while you're driving. A hole in the piston will teach you about timing. Yes, it will. You always need to street tune after dyno tuning. Certainly that's the case after engine dyno. In Australia, a lot of tuners are starting to do dedicated E10 tunes. Everything else is getting too expensive. Want to pay and learn the Holly tuning classes? That's another good option is they're, they will teach you that stuff because they want you to do it correctly. You can run boost on propane. Yes, that's true. Let's see, what RPM is good for a stock bottom end with 10 pounds of boost? I don't think you should worry about RPM. You should just worry about power production. 
have a Gen 2 LT1, plan to freshen up and install JE pistons. 218, 224 cam. Will the dish forge pistons drop the NA power dramatically? How there are they 31 cc domes? I mean dishes. That's going to change it a lot because isn't that LT1 a flat top? What live feed were you on talking about motorhome motors? We were earlier. We were talking about that a little bit with 440s, and somebody somebody was asking about the V10 Fords. Richard, when you tore down the L33, did it have a factory timing chain tensioner? I don't think that it did. I know, Marco. That's what we're talking about. How, how do how do you get 10 psi at 1,000 RPM? That's what I'm talking about. You never see that intersection, like not in the real world. It, it'd have to be a really small turbo to to be able to make that happen. And and by the way, that's way too much timing at 1,000 RPM. You try to get a hold of a 6.6. Nope. I'm sitting here listening to you decoding my Chevy RPO codes. Nice. How much time do you pull per pound of boost? I don't do it that way because if you think about it, if you if you let's say that you pulled one one degree per pound of boost, if you're running thirty pounds, you would have zero degrees of timing. And the, I know the motor's not going to run very good there. And so I don't think it's I don't think that that's a that's a rough idea. That's like saying you have fifteen percent drivetrain loss or 20% drivetrain loss or whatever people are saying, whatever the number is, that gives you a rough idea, but it's not, it's not something that I would do as an absolute. The Holly closed loop can be enabled once the tune is dialed in, at least that's how we do it. We, we can do that also, and that's not unusual, as long as you put the amount of change that it will allow to two or three or a maximum of 5%. A lot of guys make that mistake as they run it in closed loop and they leave it at 100% adjustability. And so if it gets unhappy for any reason, it's just like loading fuel or taking away fuel. And then it's doing these big swings and you're like, you need to just relax. <laughs> you need to not do that. So that's why I like tuning it the way that I do. And then if I were to put it in a car, I would leave a little bit of adjustability in it, but it, it shouldn't need ever need very much. It's going to have some based on, you're going to have some adjustability also based on um, air temperature and water temperature. But I don't want it adjusting too much. <laughs> when we talk Hemi, are you talking about the Gen 3 Hemi? Uh, Dirk, this, this fan is a uh, pellet fan. <laughs> I plan for 400 horsepower N8 and 600 with boost and then 800. So you're going to run 15 pounds of boost or whatever in race trim with good gas, hopefully. 94 Gen T factory roller. Everybody hit the like button. That's right. You can run boost on propane. It has higher octane. Yep. How do modern engines like the EcoBoost get away with higher compression? I think the 2.7 is 10 and a half and it runs 87 octane. When it's running 87 octane, it has almost no timing in it. And they're also, they're probably also limiting boost, I would imagine. And they're also relying heavily on factory knock sensors that are programmed. Stock is 10 and a half to one. So I'm dropping to a dish forge one. Is but is it a is it a 30 cc dish? That's a lot. That's gonna be like three points of compression you're dropping. If you've done any tests on air filter size, impact on power and boosted applications when it becomes a restriction, not on the engine dyno yet. I would like to. We've done some of that in the car, but Todd, it, this is all, this is education. This is um, this is your secondary education. <laughs> GM RPO code for a three forty two gear ratio. It is good. That's a good rear end to have. 
Can you give a shout out to my wife, Patrick and Angela? Yeah, Patrick and Angela, what's going on? Shout out, Richard. Can you discuss limitations on boosted pump fuel setup with a stock 42 pound injector? The bigger pump is necessary. Well, there would be a limitation to how much, if you have a, I don't know if you have a stock fuel pump. Is that what you're talking about? If you have a stock fuel pump and a boosted pump, you still are limited in fuel flow because all you've done is sped the pump up quite a bit. And there's still a limitation to whatever it will flow at this new pump speed because that's all you're doing. So you, you could increase the fuel flow by whatever they're saying the percentage gain is 30, 40, 50%. But after that, you still have no more fuel flow. A bigger pump would be the way to go. And, and having the boosted pump with a bigger pump. What platforms do you use to tune the engine dyno? I don't, I don't ever do HP tuners or any of the factory deals because we don't ever use, I don't ever use factory ECUs. Not, I can't say ever. I have run the the Coyote with a factory ECU and then the L83 with a factory ECU. And I think we did use either HP tuners or SCT with the, with both of those. I didn't do the tuning on the Holly. I mean, on the, um, on the Coyote, but I started doing tuning on the, on the L83 because after Eric showed me, Hey, you click this button to add fuel and take away fuel and timing and, and, cam timing, then it's not that hard. My tuner's telling me to get a Vinci cam instead of the Truck Norris cam because they're too hard to tune. The If it's an L92, the Truck Norris cam should be pretty mild in that combination. Getting rid of the OptiSpark, that's probably a good idea. What benefits does a built wheel have over a cast wheel? Quick, slightly quicker spool. <clears throat> I don't know that that's the case. I, I don't think the billet thing by itself is necessarily going to do that. Usually they're stronger. And usually when they go to a billet on the same configuration versus a cast, is they change the wheel design. So maybe it flows more. Richard, would you consider doing more NSR truck cams like the comp cam? For the that cam will not fit in a 4.8 or a 5.3. You can't use that with stock cams. The stock cams on a 4.8 and a 5.3 will not allow 541 lift. They will only go to 500 lift. Do you have any advice for tuning an oxygenated fuel? Well, the oxygenated fuel should change the air fuel. So you should be able to, you'll probably have to put more fuel in. Uh, did it. Yeah. If you're taking out 30 cc's of, uh, a 30 cc dish, every 10 cc's is going to be about a full point. Have you ever tuned idle with a cam? Yeah, a lot. Because when we were doing the, when I was doing all of the factory cams, I had to have the I had to have them idle at the same idle speed, so I had to play with that a little bit because I wanted to know what the uh, idle vacuum was, and I had to get that at the same RPM. So I did some tuning with the idle stuff too. What are the best NA mods for a five seven Hemi? You want a camshaft. LT four has four valve release. But that's okay. I don't care about the valve release, but does it have a dish in it? Zero Dark 30 is coming. Yep. Tomorrow's a, it's <laughs> tomorrow's a school. It's a school night tonight. I'll keep my 11 to 1 and stick to E85. That is a good combination. Do you know the max cam valve spring lift on a stock LQ4 with 317 heads? I don't. Does anybody know? Um, let's see. Who might know that? James, do you know what? Are are all of the valve springs the same on all of the year 317 heads?
because I know that the early ones use, they actually use the same LM7 LR4 camshaft. And I know that they went to a different camshaft after that. And I know that the LQ9 used a different camshaft. I'm thinking that they may have upgraded the springs and went to the 550 lift springs. If they did, then you could run 550 lift cams on those, depending on what year it is. Have you ever used the 6V53 supercharger? I have not. Why isn't there much talk on information on stock spring lift on Vortec and LS valve springs? We were just talking about that. The stock LS3 valve spring is a 550 lift. That's how much lift you can get away with. <laughs> and the and the stock 706, like the early or, or 48 and 53 stuff, that's 500 lift. So there, you, you have your answer. Spring, yes, springs are the same. Springs are the same as what? Question about idle hang. I have a 239.52. That's a big camshaft. 383LS likes to hang at 2000 until I'm at dead idle. What do I need to mess around with the curve? Um, maybe ask James about that. I'm not sure, but anything over 500 lift, I would upgrade the springs. The LS3 stuff is definitely 550 lift. And, and the LY6 was 550. I just don't know if the LQ9, if they stepped up to that spring, or if the later LQ4s did, unless they're blue or yellow, they're not 550. Uh, that's not true. The, the, the LY6 was not blue or yellow, and it was a 550 lift spring. I'm 17. I just got a 305 TPI Trans Am. Nice. It's like the first time you see a Trans Am. Simple ways to gain power. Mm, camshaft is, but you're going to go with simpler stuff. Um, maybe tuning, timing of the throttle body, airfoil, air intake, headers, exhaust kind of thing. The LQ9 cam isn't different. It's different than the early LQ4, but then did the LQ4 also get that same camshaft? I'd still do springs. It is a good idea. We ran the on the 5.3 with the stock springs. We ran the Brian Tooley cam, the NSR Truck Norris cam with the stock springs because I wanted to find out. I think I did. I either ran either that or on the 4.8. Maybe it was on the 4.8. Um, but at any rate, we ran it with the stock springs on and it worked fine. No, it couldn't have been the 5.3 because that already has cams in it. I mean, already has springs in it because we run a bunch of cams through it. So it had to be on the 4.8. Any advice for tuning a 462 valve non PI with PI heads, intake swap, and stock PI cams on 93 octane? Um, the compression is going to be high on that one. The stock cams, it's going to be a little timing sensitive. What have you found is MBT timing for Gen 3 dual plug Hemis? I think that they wanted the same kind of timing curve that an LS has, so about 29 at the top. What's a common oil pan for Fox body swaps? Does anybody have any idea? I haven't I haven't done a Fox swap, so I don't know what pan they're using. Do you have any testing with an LSA blower? I don't. I, I do too. I think there would be a lot. I've talked to Terry um, Coverman, and I, he's been out a couple of times. So I've sat, sat down. We had lunch and stuff. He's a really good guy. And, and we were supposed, supposed to put something together on an LSA blower, but I just haven't tested it. But they're going to do the same thing that all the other positive displacement blowers I run lots of. Uh, solid lifters on a hydraulic cam ramp. Is this on a, is this on a big block Chevy? <laughs> I need to buy Richard a t-shirt that says the answer is camshaft. L20 4.8 with 799s. Would you, which max lift I could run with the trending upgrade? The the maximum, why, why do you want to run a lot of lift? First of all, that's my question. Actually, your first question should be how much power do you want to make? And then how can I do that? And lift is not how you're going to do that. You, you want to have duration. That's what's going to make power. The LQ4 and LQ9 cam is the same part number. So after they, because the early LQ4 was not the same camshaft. The early LQ4 is the LM7 
LR4 camshaft. They shared that same camshaft, a really tiny one. And then they upgraded the camshaft. And I didn't know that they both got the same one, but maybe they did. Uh, standard L76 springs, max at 520. I've never seen anything be at 520. They're, they're always 500 or 550. An L76 spring is... Is that a... um? Is the L76 a rec port head like an LY6? Yeah, Travis, that's what I thought. What What is the lift on the LQ9 um, camshaft on the 2001 to 2006? I think purchased too big of a turbo. What is the effect? It, it'll just be really soft. It'll be soft down low. So an L76 is going to be the same head that's on a, that's going to be like an 821 or an 823 or something. That's going to be the same head that's on the LY6. And when we measured it, that was a, that was the 550 lift spring. Specifically the 09 six liter Gen 4s. Battery life's dying. All right, Todd. We'll see you later, man. 457, 460. Yeah, so that's still going to be way under the 500 lift rule. So we're still at, so we're right at 50-50 if 18 degrees of timing is too much at 10 PSI. So for you guys that are watching that and you guys that are thinking about trying that, you should not try that under any circumstances. No, the truck's got good springs. Maybe the LS2 Blazer did. Trailblazer. The LS2 was an LS3 spring. That was the same one. That 243 head got the LS3 spring. Can getting the hot side smaller help? It can help a little bit, but if the, if the whole turbo is too big, even going tighter on the hot side might not spool that compressor up. Both of them need to be within a certain range to work well. I have a 5.3 board to 5.7 with a stock 5.7 internals and a big mother thumper cam, mainly for sound. Timing on top is 29. Will I gain anything extra from more timing or do you think it's at its peak? My guess is it's at its peak. I mean, you can always try, if you have a dyno, you could try more timing. I don't know what heads you have on that. The only time we see more timing than that is when we run a 317 head. It usually wants a degree or more or two sometimes of timing. All right, Casey, feel better, man. Tim, happy to help. I have a 76 350 truck. I have the 262 cam in it. That's a good one. Long tubes, performer, 650. The stock heads be good, or is it worth getting Vortec heads? A Vortec head on that would be a good upgrade. Because it's going to add, um, my guess is that 76 truck motor has a, has a big chamber head. It's a 76 cc's. And the Vortec head is going to raise compression, and it's going to be more a more powerful head. But the intake manifold that you have won't, won't work on the Vortec head. you got to get a Vortec-specific intake manifold. I don't see a lot of blow through carb videos. I have some up on the channel. Run lots of small block and big block Ford and Chevy stuff with blow through carburetors and some LS stuff with blow through carburetors. We didn't, we didn't put a distributor on the LS, but we did do a, um, a, a MSD ignition controller. I ran a 522 lift, 529 NSR on my 04. LQ. Big block Ford, 557, 11 and a half to one, switching to 671, injected alcohol from, from nitrous. Would 671 be too small? 
your 671 is not going to make 20 pounds on a 557. It won't be anywhere near that. And it's too small for 1400 horsepower. The 671 won't make that much power. Is there a way to tell when you open up the 317 heads? If you open them up and, and look at them, and if they're either blue or yellow, they're a 550 spring. If they're not, <laughs> then, then you don't know. In general, what IATs would you start to pull timing? I, I wouldn't just do it based on IATs. I would also do it based on pressure. And I would be ultra conservative on a roots blower with pump gas. It's a cheap turbo, so I just get another one. Yeah, you should, what is your combination and how much power do you want to make? And we can tell you what size turbo you should put on there. Uh, James, all that's good information, but it doesn't tell us what the coil bind is, which is what we need because that's going to determine how much lift we can get. Other than marginal power increases, does it make sense to carburate a fuel injected motor? The, the question is more complicated than that because that would only assume that you are using the same intake manifold. Like if you were using a single plane intake manifold that was set up for port injection and then you ran a carburetor on it and then ran it fuel injected like we did for the video. And then the carburetor tends to make a little bit more power. But usually when somebody is switching from fuel injection to a carburetor, they're changing the whole induction system. So they could go from like a truck manifold to a dual plane or a single plane carbureted deal on an LS and they will lose power on both of those. Richard, I can get a 496 Marine motor. Nice with all Ford scat bottom end with 088 heads. Will I have a problem bolting this in a 71 Chevelle? No, that all of that is good. The, the, the uh, motor mounts are gonna be, that's just a big block, right? Unless you're talking about an 8.1, um, Gen 7 motor. Are you talking about a 496 Stroker Gen 6, Gen 5, or Mark 4? Or are you talking about the 8.1? Stock 4, 302, stock pistons, AFR 165 heads, extreme energy, 274 cam, any clearance problems with 1.6 rockers? You're going to have to measure that. What's the best cam you'd run on a stock L92? You, the only buddy that can determine the best cam is you, Nicholas, unfortunately. That's why I have all the videos up. You can pick the cam that you want, but you also have need to consider all the other things. Idle, drivability, torque, low speed torque. Does it need a converter? All of that stuff. So I can't determine what the best one is. Only you can do that. Pump gas and nitrous. At what point should I go to pump gas and nitrous at? At point, should I go to pump gas 10 to 1 compression? Are you talking about at what point should you run race gas? In my dozens of LQ engines, I've yanked a part. I've never seen springs that look anything like 550 capable springs. Have you have you ever measured them to see what they are? Just curious. I, I thought that they were all the the small springs on a on a 317 head and on definitely on the 862s and the 706 heads. Those are all the smaller springs. Some of the 243s definitely have the big springs on because we know on the LS2 they did. Uh, Greg, you're running 34 degrees of timing at 40 pounds of boost at 8,500 RPM with 10 to one static. So <clears throat> you must have really good gas in it. And what kind of four cylinder would want 34 degrees at 40 pounds of boost? Is it a, is it an eight valve Dodge mode or something that has a really terrible combustion chamber? Uh, 
Uh, Thomas, what's the best cam? You got to, for, for all of you people out there that are here that want to ask about the best cam, you can't do that. <laughs> There's no best cam. There's no such thing. You have to be specific about what you want to do. Do you want to have, does it have to run a stock converter? Do you want good idle? Do you want good drivability? Do you want low speed torque? Do you want mid range power? Are you going to put gears in it? Are you going to put a converter in it? Do you not care about any of that and you just want chop? Do you want maximum peak horsepower or peak torque? What are the things on the list of how to make a good camshaft? What are those things? What are those things most important? So what order do you have all of those in? And then we get hone in on, there's going to be hundreds of cams that will do the thing that you want it to do. There's not going to be one that does that. There's going to be lots and lots of them. That's good news for you because you have lots of them to choose from. So Dave has a Dave Norman has a listing of different springs. Maximum lift is five seventy. The LS six LS three springs maximum lift is five seventy. L seventy six maximum lift is five thirty. So for years, everyone's been calling those the five fifty lift springs, and they they're actually five seventy lift spring. So it would depend on what your actual installed height is. But that's what I'm saying is you that those springs, the LS3, LS6 springs, the, the blue or the yellow ones, you can run 550 lift cams in them. And the other ones, like a 706 spring, you can run 500 lift cams in them. Richard, do you think going to a 1.8 rocker on an LS or even 1.7 on the intake or 1.8 on the exhaust is worth doing? On, on which camshaft? Is this on a stock camshaft? I have videos up on doing roller rockers. The things I don't like about roller rockers and changing the ratio on, roll, on LS rockers particularly is that you need a lots of valve spring to make that happen, to have it work, because the rockers are going to be much heavier and they're going to valve float a lot earlier. And you can get so much power with the camshaft that the rocker isn't going to do much. And after you've already put the camshaft in and now have 550 or 600 lift, the rocker tends to add less power then. You lost the live feed on your PlayStation. That's not good. Two more minutes. I run a 212, 224 cam. 510, 540, and make about 360 torque. Very close cam to the Crane 227. What is the Crane 227? Is that is that the 224, 227 one that I, I run? 243, 251, 200 pounds on the seat, and 520 open, hydraulic roller. 520 open seems like a lot. Is that not, is that on a, um? that's not an LS, right? That's a lot of open pressure for a hydraulic roller LS. Uh, Mike, which one is the... Oh, you already have the... Um... So that's their like Super Wazoo Turbo Race Cam. Are you running that kind of motor? Is it, is it like a 1500 or 2000 horsepower motor? Yeah, James, I saw I saw your thing on that you can't find the springs. That's okay. <clears throat> it's an EJ20 stroke to 2.2. Why why oh you oh you toluene, okay. Makes 50%. I don't have any experience at all on that kind of fuel, so I don't have any idea what could, that that timing seems like a ridiculous amount of timing to me. I don't know why it would I've never heard of any turbocharged thing needing that much timing, but I don't have any experience with that particular fuel. So maybe that's why you're, it's doing that.
Jimmy, this is a good question for, and this will be the last one for tonight. What is the percentage of nitrous shot on NA power that you feel is comfortable with, like 100 shot on 300? That would be more than adequate. Normally, 50% seems like a fairly good rule on some applications. <laughs> like with the Big Bang one, we were trying to go to 100%. So we were taking a 500 horsepower motor and trying to add 500 horsepower with the nitrous. As you start doing that kind of stuff, you start getting particular about what you would want for maybe for head flow intake to exhaust flow relationship and cam timing and all that stuff. Honestly, I didn't really care about that. I just wanted it to make as much NA power as we could on the 5.3. So a 50% rule is kind of what we look at at West Tech. So if we've got a 500 horsepower motor, you can run a 250 shot on it. It, it, it. We've run more than that. But that's a really, that's a realistic kind of ceiling for street motors. Um, less than that is even better, you know, 100 shot or 150 or 200 shot on a 400 horsepower motor is, um, you know, certainly doable. As you go up in percentages, though, it gets more difficult for the motor to process that. Mark, have you considered doing a dual overhead cam engine to show how exhaust cam timing affects turbo spool and performance? Turbo spool on the engine dyno is not really, it's not really a good place to show turbo spool. It's much better in its natural environment, <laughs> whether that's on a chassis dyno with a roller or out on the street or at the track. And what we've seen on the engine dyno anyway is when the motor makes really good NA power, it <laughs> makes really good boost power. Um, and I know that on some of the tuning with the boost stuff is that they, we found a lot of ways to make a whole bunch less power with cam timing. Um, and maybe on the K24 that, well, I don't think we have, we don't have variable cam on both of those on that one though. So maybe a coyote would be a better one to test that on. Can a single GT35 make 500 at the wheel on a 5.3? I think that that would be hard pressed to do that. I think the back pressure would be too high. Uh, Mike, on that combination, the guys at Brian Tooley with that camshaft would know a lot better about what's going on. They've run more of those motors. I don't run that type of drag race motor and, and have not even run one of those on the engine dyno. Anthony, thank you much. Thank you very much. Have a great night, Richard, and everyone. Deuce. Have you had any experience with the Gen 3 LS1? Yes, lots and lots of them. I wrote two books on them. Not just the LS1, but lots of other ones. That was the first motor that I ran that was LS-based. Was We ran a bunch of 5.7s. Uh, Doug, this is interesting. So I'm, uh, first of all, I got to close out the poll at 49%, 51% saying yes, that is too much timing. 49% saying no. And then the last one for tonight, uh, Hey Richard, Richard, we're building a Godzilla 7.3 with ported heads, Brian Wolf cam and a Whipple. You want to come do a dyno test? Where are you at? What, what state are you in? Or just send me a, uh, send me a email, I guess. And on that note, it's time to go. Thank you all for showing up. <laughs> Hope you like the uh, multi-live. Maybe I should just do one every hour <laughs> for 24 hours. Maybe that would be, uh, what could we do that for? We could do the all, we could do an all-nighter. And so we could do 24 of them um, just in a row. That'd take a lot of prep though. That would be kind of cool though. We'll have to think about that. Maybe when I have one video and it would be a while before it reached it, but maybe for um, if I reach 300,000 subscribers or if this one video, and we could see which one of those might happen first, if this one video reaches a million views, because I have one that's 700 and something thousand. So it's kind of three quarters of the way there. Uh, so we'll see if it if that happens. That <laughs> then we, And I would, I would, I would do one each hour. That would be kind of fun. So maybe for one of those milestones, that would be something that I would think about, get all hopped up on Red Bulls or whatever and just, you know, just do it up. Thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you all tomorrow morning. Pow, bang, zoom.